Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. We are here in beautiful Salt Lake City now for the fourth time in the last five weeks. Today, it's for the Paraclimbing Nationals. It's actually the first time Paraclimbing has ever made it onto the live stream, so I know our athletes are very excited to be here. I am excited as well. My name is Al Smith. I'm going to be your commentator throughout the rest of this day, calling the shots exactly as I see it and hopefully adding a little bit to the program. We are going to have a few special guests coming on through us throughout the day, so make sure to keep a lookout for that. And that's about all I have for you for now, so there's nothing left to do but to sit back and enjoy the show. Thank you so much for joining us. There's another shot, beautiful Salt Lake City. Sounds like I'm coming through the house right now. In addition to the live stream, we're gonna clear that up. Yeah, okay, we've killed it in the house. Now it is just me and everyone at home on the internet. In beautiful Salt Lake City here, we're sitting in the booth right now, and I've actually got a special guest with me, someone uh, who's got a tremendous amount of experience, and, and, and I don't even know the full extent of it. Um, her name is Karima Bats, and um, Karima, how you doing? Yeah, we, we have many competitors here, many different categories. Today is the first time Paraclimbing Nationals, uh, I've been told, is the first time it's been officially recorded in any capacity, let alone to wind up in the live stream. That's very cool. I think it's going to add something. And we've got some very, very competitive, very capable people here today. The action is going to be very cool in qualifiers yesterday. Um, climbers all across the board really fighting, obviously, for the win, trying to get that strong qualifying position, trying to get on the podium, get gold. Uh, so as with any competition we see, uh, I think the, the, the level of fight, so to speak, is up a notch. You really take it to the next level when you're at a, a nationals event. Yeah, it's very cool to, to see how each of those categories um, is, gonna, is going to help manifest different styles, different approaches to climbing. Um, I think I just discovered for our friends at home that Karima's mic has been off this entire time. So unfortunately, <laughs> y'all missed a lot of good content. I'm going to take the blame for that one, and I apologize, but... Um, things we discussed so i'm just gonna it's just our take first my word one though so this is the first ever time we're streaming there's down to, is bound to be snafus the only snafus we won't see is these routes i mean they look pretty amazing i think they are incredibly fitting for the type of climbers that are going to be coming in today yeah and we do the the setting staff here is incredibly talented uh you told me we have an ifsc setter we've got um, maybe two at least two setters who have experience uh, setting at the World Cup. Definitely. So the athletes are of the highest caliber, and uh, it's just fitting that the setters would be of the highest caliber as well. Um, so hopefully these routes offer a little bit more excitement than uh, the run-of-the-mill routes that these competitors are used to climbing on. And it's a great facility because we're here at Momentum Climbing in, in Salt Lake City, and they have really worked hard to create an accessible experience for the para climbers coming in to climb today. And we really, really appreciate it. Um, everything from uh, building ramps and uh, making sure bathrooms are available are also part of the climbing experience for para climbers to feel comfortable in any climbing facility, and they have done that. Yeah, it's it's cool to see how how many ways uh, para climbing as a sport, as an organization, as a subcategory of USA Climbing and in these individual competitions are continuing to grow. Um, basically, 
every year a, a better job is being done to bring more to it. More athletes are joining in, participating. Um, the events are getting, they're just more to them. And it's just cool. It's just, it's cool to see any growing sport, uh, and especially in a piece of climbing, like paraclimbing, to see to see its growth and the excitement that comes around it is really cool. And before we get into our first climber, Karima, I'd like to, for our audience at home, and, and frankly for myself, to learn a little bit more about you. You are quite involved in these things. You've uh, now you said to me yesterday you founded Adaptive Climbing. Is that correct? Uh, well, not Adaptive Climbing. No, there's okay, many I think people I got before it. me that founded. Sure. But I'm the founder of Adaptive Climbing Group, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. That one of the um, assets of our our program is that we fully sponsor athletes to compete nationally and internationally in climbing competitions. I myself, myself was the first female paraclimber to compete in a USA climbing sanctioned cop. Uh, competition under adaptive climbing uh, so this is a very roundabout uh, experience for me to be behind the mic with you today yeah and you you said you're the first female paraclimber uh, under USA climbing ever yeah okay so that's cool yeah <laughs> 2013 very ex long time ago <laughs> ex competitor organizational powerhouse um, someone that's been on both sides of the coin and now on this third side of the coin, so to speak, in the booth with me here. It's uh, it's very cool to uh, have your perspective and your experience, and I do appreciate you coming into the booth today. Well, I appreciate you having me because I have had such a great journey with a lot of the competitors that are going to be showing their work today, and I have seen them grown over the years, and I am super proud of what we're going about to watch today. Can I ask, are, are all the competitors here part of your team, do you call it the Adaptive uh, Climbing Group, or are there other organizations? Well, I have sp about nine sponsored athletes for this year's season, but there are some athletes here that I have sponsored over the years, yes, that's been on my athlete team before, such, such as Justin Salas, which is one of our top uh, VI climbers who proved himself in nationals since 2017 and gold at Worlds uh, back in 2019 in Briançon, France. Um, Eris Skinderi, who's making his appearance at his first competition here in the VI category. He climbs weekly in my program in New York City in thir on Thursdays. So yeah, I have a great relationship with them, even if they're not sponsored directly by me right. this year. <laughs> you, you know everyone uh, just about, which is very cool. Um, you've got so much more insight into these athletes than I can provide. Um, and today we, we have Many heavy hitters here, many of these competitors have competed in Worlds. Um, they're no stranger to competition. They've been climbing outside, climbing on plastic, climbing in national level comps and in Worlds even. Um, so they're serious. In short, the, the, many of the athletes here are serious and have been to the highest level already. But on the other side of things, we do have uh, many competitors that are here for the first time in nationals or um, aging in from the youth category into open. Uh, so it's it's neat that we've got both sides of it. You've got your seasoned competitors as well as people that are here for the first time. And, and that doesn't make them any less competitive, but experience-wise, uh, it's great to see that people just getting started. Definitely. We also want to give, I want to give a shout out to all the volunteers that are here that are working judge, belaying, uh, you know, taking some time today um, to be here for our athletes. So it looks like they're having the preview of their routes now. Uh, we have the AL2 category females there, the AL2 male categories that are um, also looking and previewing their routes that they're about to climb this morning. Yeah, I believe they get three minutes for each route, and I could be wrong about this. I, I think the format is slightly different, um, but they have three minutes for each route, and that's there they are doing their thing um, the same way that they would in finals. Um, and this is the first time the that our paraclimbing nationals actually had a finals. It's usually a red point format, but 
we have slowly been making the moves from aligning with the rest of the International Federation of Sport Climbing in how we format our competitions. So yesterday was qualifiers where we uh, kept with a red point format, but today we are having a finals similar to how the rest of the world in paraclimbing conducts their competitions, which means they're gonna be ready to take on the world in just a few months. So it seems like it's a step up again to, to have finals for the, you're on the live stream for the first time. We have finals uh, and there, there is certainly an, an amount of suspense and intensity and nervousness that comes with finals in an on-site format. And that's a really important part of competition at a national level, you wanna feel that heat when you go into finals, um, and I'm sure they feel it out there right now, and it's, I l love that they're stepping up. The organization is stepping up, the level of competition is stepping up. We've got a real finals here. Oh yeah, and what from what I saw in qualifiers, the route setters definitely had to step their game up in finals. So I'm excited to see what kind of snags that they threw out these climbers. Some of our uh, top climbers, um, some who have US team experience, kind of breezed through the qualifiers. There were quite a few flashes in the, in the uh, male arm category yesterday for qualifiers. So I'm, I'm especially excited to see that later on today to see how that works out. And in the male leg category, that's the most stacked group of climbers. To me, I'm excited to see that category for sure this morning. I was speaking with the setting crew and I, I believe uh, the male leg category is the yellow route. They said that's the hardest one. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be shared by RP3. Uh, that's range of power three. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's the hardest route in the room. Many uh, athletes and many of you at home may know Ronnie Dixon, Justin Salas, um, and, and many others who are competitive that I'm not personally familiar with, but I do know a few of them, and I've climbed with a few of them, and I know they ain't no joke. They're ready to climb hard and, put, and give on a show. Um, I believe uh, Ronnie Dixon had a film sponsored by Evolve some time ago where he uh, sent a V10 boulder, I believe, about a few years ago. Yeah, maybe in the gunks. I don't know if it was south or something, but we definitely okay. got to look it up. But he's definitely yeah, someone could be to watch. More than one. Yeah, could it could be, be more than one. Yeah, I mean he's pretty amazing. Um, and uh, Justin Silas like is is V nines and V tens all the way out in Joe's Valley. Like that's his that's his home crag, and I'm sure they're gonna give us a show for sure. And speaking of Ronnie Dixon and of you, Karima, uh, you were telling me before we went live, you watched a video of Ronnie back in the day, mm -hmm. and that was your initial inspiration to say, I'm gonna go try climbing too. Yeah, like, actually, yeah, because I didn't know any amputees who climb, and, and that's why this is means so much, because representation and visibility matters. There may be another person with a similar disability and sees themselves in these athletes and will be inspired to join us next year, which is gonna immensely grow this program. So it's, it's extremely significant that we're live streaming now because that, that visibility, having the chance for that story to be told and for that story to be heard, exactly like your experience, you, you saw a piece of media on the internet of um, a climber with a similar disability to you crushing outside and that was it. That was the impetus for you to be sitting where you are now, for you to be competing and being involved in the sport. And hopefully that gains some critical mass with something like a major live stream like this and all of the, the top paraclimbing athletes um, getting to share their stories, share their performance, put on a show. Um, I imagine this is only the beginning. It's gonna, of course it's gonna grow. Of course it'll oh, be bigger definitely. next year. I mean, it, it already grew. Um, I remember if you would look back at 2016 when we did this competition in Stone Summit, we only had like 35 athletes that competed. And then in Ohio pre-pandemic, we had about 100, you know, in 2019. So that gives you a good example of, of the amount of growth it had, even without a live stream. I can't imagine what we're gonna see coming up. Very, very cool. It looks like they made a transition back to isolation, and we're gonna get ready to see some climbing soon, and I'm really excited. Yeah, we see our 
setters or volunteers, our judges out there, getting thing getting things together. I want to make another quick shout to the volunteers. I do it every time, oftentimes in-house uh, uh, to the audience. You know, you can get the entire crowd behind it. Um, and I always say this, that there is something very visceral about having an entire crowd of several thousand people yell at you in celebration of what you're doing. But again, the volunteers, in this case, anyway, there is no crowd. The, the, the event today is not a spectator event. That's We're here with you in the booth instead, but we want to shout out these volunteers. They, it's, all, it's the same cast of characters. It's not, you don't work one weekend a year and you're done. Um, it's kind of a whole traveling act where everyone is, these volunteers, and I've said this last weekend at the North American Cup as well, they've got real jobs. Some of them are the vice president of uh, whatever organization, and they're, they are organizational powerhouses. They work very hard, they're very committed, and they're, they're many, many weekends out of the year at events like this working. Uh, and I always, admire what they're doing it it's it can feel a little cliche t for things like this would not be possible without x thing this wouldn't be possible without our volunteers but it could not be more true that the usa climbing as an organization leans so heavily on its volunteers and specifically the fact that it's the same volunteers who aren't just bodies and hands mm -hmm. but they know yeah they're leaning some on of these, these volunteers are actually family members and participants in some of the organizations that are sponsored these athletes. You know, I, I see Al out of uh, my program in Chicago who flew all the way from Chicago on his own dime just to volunteer, be a belay volunteer. I see the boyfriend of uh, Madison Tott out of California who's over there uh, helping with the running order, you know? Uh, we Now we're seeing some of our uh, seated climbers, which is uh, the RP, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, a, the AU category, the AL, AL1 category, sorry. Um, and these are athletes who are usually uh, live life through uh, movement in a seated position. Uh, they use wheelchairs as assisted devices, but they have uh, no use of their legs, so they campus their routes. And so that means that they are two limb climbers. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I've heard this is one of the most exciting ones to watch. The campus routes are cool because as any, any gym climber, any young gun coming out the world, any anybody loves to campus routes in the gym. Um, and it's rare that you can campus an entire route. Uh, it's something that many people think, you know, it's, it's just something that I think all climbers think is cool, basically. So right. to have an entire category that is by design made to be campused is cool to watch. I think that's one of my, that's one of the things I'm looking forward to the most. Yeah. And that's a whole nother level of strength, different muscles being used. Um, and talk about the energy expenditure in campusing, you know, it's kind of like, who has the strongest and you're going to see some interesting things you're going to see campusing and resting you never hear about people like resting during campusing like how do you do that so i can't wait to talk about that later but i also see we have our first athletes out ready to climb in uh the female leg amputee category seated is Lauren Pine. She's on the runner list to be up first. And we have our only youth visually impaired climber um, who is Chloe Poston. She has a lot of energy. Um, That's her on the left side, orange right. shirt. She's visually impaired, but she's the only youth climber. So she's gonna be the first one out. Of course, during the pandemic, our, our numbers are a little bit lower um, in the categories than we would like, but we can't wait till we're maskless and we're at uh, full throttle in our competitions next year. She's got a lot of energy. She has great climbing. Um, and this is like a, a entryway to what she'll be doing next year when she turns 16 and she'll be able to join the adults and vie for a U.S. team spot. Yeah, so um, just for the people at home, 16 is the bare minimum to be in the open category. And prior to that, you're in youth. And the at paraclimbing the, in the youth category, 
everyone's in the same category. It's just one delineated category as yeah. a youth. And once you age at 16 into open, then it becomes more specific, uh, whether it is um, the amputee lower, amputee upper, range of power, or visually impaired, um, which I think is a, a cool that you get to, the more specific a category can be, that the routes are going to be set for you better. You're going to be competing against people that are sharing your experience closer. Um, so I think it, it just seems like a cool thing to be leaving the youth category, getting into and, and getting to compete more directly against yeah. the rest of the people. Absolutely. I'm not sure what the range of her visual impairment is, but um, for, for those at home who are not uh, very familiar with visual impairment and how it works, um, uh, Chloe is an albino, and, and part of the uh, the abilities of Bilo, as, as you know, her hair is, you know, very blonde and her skin is very light. But those who are albino tend to have uh, visual impairments. So mm -hmm. that is actually why she has fallen into this category. And that's something that you're born with. Some of our competitors are born with their disabilities and some are not, which is why our youth categories tend to be very small. Because, because they're they're younger they're, they have an experience an incident in their life that may have given them a disability give them, and put them in paraclimbing made them able to join the club <laughs> i see i see and uh, just briefly for again for the people at home uh who aren't familiar with the breakdown of the paraclimbing categories you're going to see our abbreviations we have al one through three and then what do we call it? AU one through threes. Now AL, it's a little, it's a little backwards in the phrasing. It's amputee lower, and then AU amputee upper. Correct. And then the numbers, um, three would be the least the severe. Least severe of a, a of, given of impairment or um, restriction of mobility. So we've got the amputee lower, amputee upper, and then visually impaired which is the abbreviation is actually represented by B, which can be a little bit confusing as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then in B1, that is uh, essentially entirely blind. And interestingly, in that category, all of the competitors wear blindfolds to, to absolutely level the playing field. Mm -hmm. um, and then B2, B3, less visually impaired. And then lastly, we've got our RP, which stands for range of power, um, and, and there are, as I understand it, a range of different disabilities that can fall into the range of power category. That seems like the most broad <laughs> um, by far, which has... I don't expect anybody at home to get it all in one go unless they have that experience, but luckily you can replay this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and I want to add as well that I'm offering the breakdown of the categories just to help everyone at home be oriented um, but the way I see it this is it's not a climbing comp for disabled people it is a climbing comp for people who want to perform who want to fight for the gold medal and uh, it is certainly not something that's going to be the primary focus. We're going to be focusing on the action, the performance, the beta, of course. And, and my favorite thing about competition, the fight. Um, and that's the same. Certain things about the competition are different. There are certain disabilities or impairments. Um, but the thing that matters and the thing that is going to define the competition more than any other is that is the same. That's the fight. That's the desire to be competitive and get the gold. Uh, and that is what, that's what I'm excited to see. I know this crew here is really excited to be here. The, the small crowd that we do have is excited to watch. Um, it's going to be good. Yeah. It looks like the seated category has rolled out of, uh, back into isolation. Uh, they have completed viewing their route. And I think we're about to see some climbing real soon. Yeah, there goes Mike. He's one of our judges, rarely, really knows the rule book well, making sure that everyone is in line always, um, which does take time. But fortunately, Karima and I are here to fill the time with you. Um, we still have Chloe down there on the bottom left corner. You can see her in the orange shirt getting ready to climb. I can't tell if she's tied in or not. And then the upper right, we have Lauren Pine. 
in AL2. Yeah, uh, we're going to have two. And when we begin, we'll have two climbers climbing at the same time. We'll try to call the action uh, as the camera follows it. Um, but do know we have a few different things that will be going on at the same time. Laura Pine is approaching the wall. We got Chloe also being tied in to her route. Lauren Pine is from Manhattan, New York. Uh, she became an amputee uh, maybe about three years ago. Uh, she was riding her bike through New York City and unfortunately um, a truck, uh, you know, wasn't driving as well as it could have been. Um, she is one of the most jovial people, and she is the oldest competitor in this category at 54 years old. 54. You lying. And she's, that means she started climbing a couple years ago. That means anybody can be here today. It is amazing. Yeah, if there is no better proof than that if, for those of you at home. If, uh, if you're thinking about it, if you ever wondered, could I do it, could I not do it, if you've ever doubted, Stop it. There's a the rumor time for that, doubt uh, is over. There's a rumor she's personal friends with Boy George, too. <laughs> We're going to have to find out. Too cool I'm for school, y'all. <laughs> track Lauren down and ask about that. There's Lauren Pine finally getting ready to go. But she was um, actually born and raised right in La Jolla, California, so I think she's happy to be back west. Very cool. We, we are happy to have her. Maybe this uh, air will do something great for climbing in finals. <laughs> we, we hope so. There's Chloe now getting started. Oh, she's moving, moving fast, making quick work of this route. She has great footwork. Very cool. Chloe, once again, our only youth competitor here, in a, in a sense, out there all alone. Ready to ready to handle the action. Now we're cutting back to Lauren Pine getting started on the yellow route. Uh, this category is very interesting because we have what we call above knee amputees and below knee amputees in this category, which changes how they approach the route. So that means that those who, um, she is what we call a, a hip amputee. Um, so that means her amputation is at the hip. Unfortunately, Lauren took a spill, but I think at 54, she's got my vote anytime. Absolutely. It, I've certainly never seen a 50-year-old competitor at Nationals. It's very cool to see anyone even be here at all, tied in, fighting for it. Um, yeah, I just I love every minute of it. Chloe now still in the fight. She's searching for her hold there. D block off there. Now below, Chloe has a collar. Um, you can't see him, but uh, the collar is replacing what a visually impaired user would use to get around. So you've seen a, a, a visually impaired person with the red and white cane that becomes their eyes, or a dog that becomes their eyes. And here, it's an individual on a microphone in the air giving them some direction in their climb. And, and Chloe's got an in-ear monitor there. Absolutely. Uh, getting the lowdown as she goes. A little Bluetooth um, device there. So a, a really a, it's a different world of processing beta. The same way normally you're getting the information from your eyes, you're breaking it down, you're deciding what to do. In this case, you're getting it in the ears and, and breaking, making decisions on the fly. Same way, saying, this is going to work. I'm feeling good. This position feels bad. Um, she's working through these transitions so well. Check yeah, out that flag right there. Really, like you said earlier, quick, not really showing any hesitation at all. Um, but as you can see, she's feeling, she's moving her hands across the hole to find where to hold it. Uh, we call that scanning when a, a visually impaired person may wave their hand on the wall looking for a hold or, or feeling, they call that scanning. Next up over here on the yellow route, I believe this is Deborah Bevilacroix getting started. This is also her first year actually competing. She's a below knee amputee like myself. 
and she seems to be moving pretty well through this route so far, just to start. This finals right route is definitely way more difficult than qualifiers, a lot more overhanging than the routes that these same climbers climbed yesterday. Which, based on what you said earlier, may, may be appropriate. It was they needed to turn it up a little bit. So. And the route setters definitely did that. Deborah here fighting a way to get up to this next, looks like, side pole. Maybe Gaston and Match will just have to wait and see. Taking her time to really find that position. There she goes, right hand side pole. Looks like she'll. Chloe is still on her route and fighting, fighting, fighting. In, in speaking of the, the time en route, um, I believe we are timing these attempts in, in the event of a tie, the way it breaks down. I was speaking to judges yesterday. Um, it goes to qualifiers first to break the tie. And if it's still tied there, it goes to time. Uh, so, well, of course, time is not the most important factor. Um, we are timing the competitors, and in the event of a tie, it will come down to that. An overhanging route for lower uh, for um, the extremity category, the amputation category, is definitely something, because the prosthesis could be anywhere between five to eight pounds of dead weight, and you're trying to move that on those holds. I mean, it's it's work. I had not considered the weight of a prosthesis, but uh, when you say it, it seems obvious that it's at added weight. Here, Chloe, nearing the top. Oh my gosh, here top she comes. Top is in sight. Gains oh, yeah. it with one, looks for the match. Chloe Poston takes it home on her route. I can't wait to see when she gets into that adult category. She is going to crush it. It really did not seem to slow her down in the slightest. Not at all. Well, there you have it. There's route one for the visually impaired category. In the top Chloe oh showing us gosh, how it's done. Here's a replay of her finish. Oh, yeah. Nice and casual, and look easy match. The match. Chloe Poston Chloe takes it home on her Now that's route. how you start. I can't wait USA to see Paraclimbing Nationals. Now, if I understand these breakdowns right in the categories and in the scoring, Chloe is the only youth competitor right now, mm -hmm. and she just put herself in first place. You know, just because you're the only competitor doesn't mean that you don't put all on the wall. Oh, of course. You're <laughs> nationals. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is uh, another note on, on aging into the open categories that you get to have that, that play with your other competitors and trying to fight for the podium. Here's Julie Jordan coming up into her route. She's another above knee amputee. Um, as you can see, she is actually wearing what we call a, a stubby, but it is a stubby that is uh, covered in uh, 510 rubber or climbing rubber, just like your shoe. And that is what she's using to climb as compared to the last competitor who used a climbing shoe on a prosthesis. Um, you will notice a lot of variation in this category based on style, based on the level of amputation, age. It's, it's amazing. And in this category, they are, you could you not use a prosthesis mm -hmm. if you wanted to. You could use one, uh, and then there's variance in what you may choose. So uh, it is cool to see how each climber's preference, uh, what they think works best for their performance, what choice they make, and we, and we see that variance already here. It's like another level of uh, beta on a climb. Of course, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Julie making quick work of the intro. Looking for a match here on the right, and then it'll be that move up to the right-hand side pull. She's actually also um, one of our more mature competitors. The inside flag. Anytime I see an inside flag in competition, <laughs> I, I tell you, I've only done it. I did it recently, and I was so excited. It's in Lander, Wyoming. I did an inside flag. Like, look at me. <laughs> look at that. 
she's trying to uh, figure out a, a way to transition um, over and up into those volumes up there. It seemed to be a level of difficulty for, for all the competitors in this category so far, actually. This point right here. Yeah, absolutely. Right now on the wall, we got one of my sponsored athletes. All right. Uh, Paige Trotter, this is her first year of competition. She's out of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, she's in the B3 category, and, and just like Chloe, she's the only uh, female B3 competitor in this competition. And I think just like Chloe, she's gonna give it her all too. Absolutely, I predict, I predict another top. I think I'm, frankly, optimistic. I see climbers come on the wall, I get excited. I say, top, I predict top. Of course, you never know, but <laughs> this is nationals. They are very capable. And I am, I'm always hoping for success. Um, her caller uh, is Patrick Sung, also out of Chicago. Um, and we're back over to our Julie, Julie Jordan. and she just took a fall, but Came she down. was on there a long time. Really, she is strong. Taking her time <laughs> to try to sort things out. Yeah, uh, it's common in competition. You got one attempt. You're figuring things out on the fly, and you're testing, testing, testing all of these different positions, trying to make it work, knowing it's the only attempt you got. So you will see people get hung up trying to make it work, make it work, find the way. What is the position? Sometimes, unfortunately, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. That particular, particular section of the yellow route, which I think the setters were telling me is the, that's the hard one. So as you can um, see, when, when she's scanning that way, she's looking for direction, uh, looking for which way to go, trying to feel around to see which of these holds feel the best. Now. I have to tell you, VI climbers have an immense set of endurance because they are waiting for the next move. They're expending energy, transitioning constantly, and scanning, trying to find where next to go, which you will not see with able-bodied climbers. Of course, in the, the lock-off, you see constantly either one arm or the other, or the other in a deep lock-off as you're trying to plan. So. You either got your left or your right, locked off all the way, switching back and forth, saying, what is the sequence? I found the left, I found the right. Which way am I going first? Not to mention the feet, of course. I think, she, I think she's trying to find uh, where on the hold is best for her to make this transition. She's starting to look a little tired there. I'm a little worried about that. I'm hoping she <laughs> finds that right foot over on that volume, that blue pill volume on the right. Yeah, that she could seems be to be lowering herself to try to, to uh, rest up, yeah, to rest up and, and hopefully makes this transition. Oh, now we have on the wall. Is that Hannah? Hannah, Hannah McFadden? McFadden. Now she's an athlete in other sports, so it does not surprise me. She is making quick work oh, yeah, through already. these volumes that other competitors had to struggle with. Hannah with a high point, I believe. Yes, she does. She is currently in the lead right now. Looks like she'll come in left hand to that volume now. Finds the feet. She's also uh, another above knee amputee, and uh, she's uh, choosing not to climb with a prosthesis as part of her style of beta. I see that exact variance that we were just discussing already showing itself here, mm -hmm. and uh, it seems like a great choice for Hannah. She's really making quick work. Looks like it's going to be a big pogo here, maybe. Oh, wow. This is a big move. Yep. She's going to have to transition left. Oh. She, she couldn't make it. But still, high point and currently in the lead in her category. Not a bad, not a bad start to her day. Yeah, excellent performance by Hannah McFadden. And uh, Paige is back on the ground. Unfortunately, she did not get to complete her route. But um, I'm quite impressed with how long she stayed up there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm, I imagine she's quite pumped. Now I wonder if it was the what what it was that stopped her. I wonder if it was those feet. Um, she's spending a lot of time working out the hands. Um, she kept feeling on those uh, same three holes, trying to figure yeah. out what was best for her to pull on. 
the judge there is showing her a zone to see what her scoring is on that particular rep. And again, just a little insight for the viewers at home. Um, the judges that are there in the chairs, obviously watching the whole time. And when a climber comes down, um, they review the score. So the climber knows where they stand, what the points are, and, uh, and in the event that they, need, they disagree or they need to make an appeal, um, they can do that. So that's what you'll see in any competition, the judges breaking down the score. And then speaking of scores, we do have um, a running score here that we've got on our phones, and we're going to throw it up on the live stream um, as we go throughout. Right now, Hannah McFadden holding the high point in first place. And then as it stands right now, we've got Deborah Bevelacroix in second and Julie Jordan sitting in third. Right now we have coming up Megan Kosak, another one of uh, my sponsored athletes uh, from our Chicago team. This is also her first year ever competing in paraclimbing. She's also in the above knee amputee, but she's actually choosing to wear uh, the Evolve climbing prosthesis. We'll see how she does. I'm not sure based on what I'm looking at in our running order, they do seem to be seated in reverse order of their qualifying position. Right, she's um, in second place coming out of qualifiers. Uh, I see, for the ladies, yep, that's correct. Looking for another high point, of course. Yeah, she, sh she made uh, some quick work and showed some fight in qualifiers, uh, not giving up. Um, and got one of the high points on one of the tougher routes of qualifiers yesterday, which moved her into second place um, above Hannah at the very last minute. Yeah, things can change at any time. We saw that last week at the North American Cup. It was a heated contest, uh, the podium being separated by attempts to zone. Uh, we thought it was going to finish in one place. It kept changing, the scores kept changing last minute. It's gonna be the same here. Megan looking to upset the scoreboard like every person that comes out. Megan approaching what is, kind of seems like it's the first crux. Yeah, I, I know personally that overhanging is, is not her, not something she was training on. So I'm wondering how she will handle this challenge. Yeah, we will see. Hopefully, well, here, I believe this is Connor, Connor Geary. Yeah, Connor Geary actually just transitioned into uh, uh, competing as an adult. Um, he's just a teenager, but he's definitely showing that he has some climbing experience overall. He's the only male uh, competitor in the B3 category, just like Paige was the only female competitor in the B3 category. Well, here he is in that same position that slowed down Paige for a while. It seems like he's got a handle on the, where he's going to there go There he from goes. There. Finding that right foot seems huge. Shuffles the hands a little bit. And Megan's off. I don't, I don't know where she fell, unfortunately, but we'll find out soon to see what position she lands herself in off of after this route. And Connor is transitioning through that difficulty that was for the other B3 competitor, Paige. Let's see if he has the power and the energy to keep it going. Oh, ah. another deep lock off there comes up just short. It's amazing because Chloe Poston, who is about a year younger than him, just crushed that route. Yeah, I honestly, I watched Chloe and I was like, is this route too easy? I don't <laughs> is know. It, is it too easy? Do, is it like, soft? I can't, I can't nah, no. I just think she's no. just that good. That's the way, <laughs> and it's another thing we talked about a bunch last weekend is that you don't have any perspective on how hard the routes actually are unless you're the one touching the holds. So you see someone do it easily, you might think, this route's too easy. You see someone fall early, not do really well, really struggle, you think this route's too hard. We don't know, we don't know. We're not the ones in the driver's seat here. We can trust the setters that their experience and know-how is being applied to the wall. They've done the best that anybody can do, and it's gonna separate the competitors. And then as the competition goes on, we sure enough, we see it. 
Some people do well. Some people make it look like it's nothing. And then some people struggle. We Here's have, Emily Gray. Mm -hmm, from South Africa, actually. Um, she lives in Colorado currently. Um, she moved to New York in 2017, joined my athlete team. And uh, she actually got to compete at Worlds in Innsbruck as the first South African paraclimber ever in 2018. She's also a three-time Paralympian swimmer for her country as well. Um, she loves it here in America. She says she's here to stay. Uh, she's using her sports science degree to really tackle climbing over the last three years. Very cool to see um, high-level competitors that are used to competing at national level or worlds in multiple sports, not just in climbing, which I think is, is, is fairly rare because you begin to specialize and then all your time, your energy, and your motivation is going just to one thing. But for some people, like Emily here, they've got enough time, motivation, or whatever it takes to compete at the highest level in many different sports. Um, and we're seeing it pay off here as Emily's looking quite strong. Must be that swimmer's endurance. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> of course, I need some of that. My shoulders need that. Here, she Emily, approaching the previous high point, I believe Hannah's high point, two holds higher. If she can pass that, that should take her into first place. Looks like a hard move oh, up and wow. right. What a nail biter. That was amazing, though. She made she moved through that very quickly. Yeah, it was it was great climbing. And those holds, they look like jugs. They look great. Who knows? They a lot of times holds that look big and positive are actually much more slopey um, than you think they are. It's Here's just, Justin. Yeah. Now he's one of our bone crushers, you could say, right? A gold medalist already at past nationals in 2017 in Boston was his first gold. He got gold at the World Championships in Briançon in 2019. Um, and he is the only B2 competitor here today at Paraclimbing Nationals. Justin looking very relaxed right now. Oh, very definitely. Casual lock off here. I believe this is more of a warm up for him then. <laughs> It may be the case, maybe we'll find a red point crux up high on the route, but right now, it doesn't seem to be a problem. He actually works for Oso Gym as Paul Robinson, uh, past USI climbing competitor and champion. Uh, Oso Climbing Gyms, uh, he's a route setter there, I believe. Okay, cool. And it seems like, it, and I, I don't have the experience to say, but if you're a route setter at a commercial gym, you got a lot of experience with the different holes, the different techniques, the different... I don't want to say tricks, but techniques that setters will use to complicate things for climbers. It seems like some really cool perspective to have, mm -hmm. if you can get it, that would help you in competition. So just a B2 category, he has what we call, uh, his particular visual impairment is called peripheral vision, meaning that um, he can only see out the, the side of, of the eye. Right. Okay. Um, and he d has to do a lot of zooming in <laughs> uh, to read things and things sure. like that. And um, so seeing the total shape of holds or where his feet are is actually uh, where his caller, Matthew, comes in to provide that guidance. And they've been working together for years. And you can tell us Justin, how easily he's just transitioning to the top very, and crushed this Very route. graceful. Executed the beta flawlessly. No hesitation. Um, He's got more. Justin's certainly got more in the tank. Oh yeah. Than that, which is clear. Here we've got Yang Zhang getting started for the gentleman. This is also his first year competing. No, nope, I was. Oh no, that's incorrect. Eris. No, that's on the other. Okay, I there. believe <laughs> the stream is incorrect. That I believe this is Yang Zhi. It is Yang Zijiang out of Charlotte, North Carolina. He's one of my athletes. I'm pretty sure I recognize him. Um, and this is his first year. Actually, he's only been climbing a year. Okay. Like consistently. Only a been year. climbing a year. Consistently. That is but he's one of those uh, marathon runners. So he's using a lot of that energy to, to try to stay on this route and tackle this. Um, 
of course, you know, this is a stack category, the male leg category. Um, and so he's up against some of the very best with years of experience, but he's handling it as well. His headspace is good and he's transitioning through these moves that actually, um, uh, you know, were a bit hard for some of our other competitors earlier. Yeah, of course. Hopefully he finds that right hand on the right side of the volume. It may cause him trouble. There he goes. Oh, wow. Look at Working that. Working out the beta. He's got he's good footwork find the there. match. Uh, he's a below knee amputee, and uh, he is wearing a specific climbing prosthesis that Evolve actually makes, which is what a lot of the, the climbers who compete wear. It's a, it's a cool thing for Evolve to be making. It's some, something specially designed for that purpose. Here, Youngzi's at a bit of oh. a crux, it looks like, making a hard move, but that coming up short. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of crux for a lot of our even best female competitors. Yes, yes. It's, it's hard to tell there whether the footholds or small, or the position is bad, um, or if maybe the hold they're just going to is not as good as you'd hope for. A lot of people are having to jump for it. Um, looks like a hard, hard hold to control. But we still have plenty of competitors here. Quick replay of Yangzi going again, finding that left hand, but it just. What is it about that particular hold that is stopping some of the climbers? I just don't know. And I, I can't wait to find out. Hopefully we can get some of them into the booth and ask. Um, oh, we got Steve Hinson tying in uh, from Colorado. Here's a replay also of Justin Salas just Who's cruising smooth. to the top. He's got like a vacation shirt on and oh, this route was a vacation for him. Breeze. <laughs> Bring this man a lemonade. Back to the action here, Steve Hinson getting ready to climb. Another below knee amputee. Uh, choosing to wear the Evolve climbing prosthesis as well. He's out of Colorado. He's a uh, marathoner by his first sport, and his second uh, and continuous sport is also climbing. It does seem like even if you came into climbing late in the game, if you have experience being a serious athlete in other categories, there's obviously many elements that are different, but there are many elements that are the same. The grit, the dedication to your training, the keeping a cool head under pressure, and, and those elements transfer very well. And then you've got to pick up a few different things, but you can see some of these climbers haven't been climbing since they were very young, but still perform. Here we go, different beta here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it... Oh. There, oh, he got it. Yes, he got it. Maybe that is the better beta, I feel, as it turns out. It also feels like he, he he touched it more on the right side of that hold. Everybody was more on the left side of that hold. Yeah, and I kind of like that cross. It really seemed to, to work well with how those His footwork foot is, is very good, too. I now, mean, his transitions he's making very this might quickly. Be move. Big move here. Oh, yeah. High point. Here's a small crowd outside really helping him out. Steve Hinson. Putting on a great show here. Quick note on the the ropes situation that you're seeing here. Um, they are it's it's a basically a modified top rope. Um, and if you're on a steep wall and you're doing what we call often free snaking, uh, top roping on a steep wall, if you fall early, you can swing out and hit the ground. So they have this initial top rope, which is now below him that they use to protect him in the first half of the route, and then he climbs above it, and then the orange rope, as you can see, um, take, catches the fall. So he, it's not as if he's gonna take a giant lead fall right now. He's one top rope for the first half, the second top rope takes over. But more importantly, honestly, the action here. Oh, oh, oh Steve geez. loses the foot, it looked like. Amazing, amazing climbing. Love to see a replay of that if we had the time. I'm, I just want to see exactly what what happened there. You know, like it was so he was I moving think, so quick through that route. I think the foot went, and that was it. And uh, it looked like the fatigue was starting to build a little bit, but I think that's what did him in. Here we got Eris Skinderi. Eris is out of uh, New York City, all the way out. You know, he drove cross country to come here. He drove. Yeah, him and his team. Well, him not specifically, but his 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 caller drove. <laughs> ah, of course. Of this course. is the B one category. This is the completely blind category. 
Long, a lot of time in the car. Either way, <laughs> here, Steve. Oh, it oh wow! Loses on that right volume. Looks a little slippery. A little bit, not as good as you would like. It can be a little disappointing. You you may you feel like you've got more in the tank. You're taking your time trying to work things out, and the foot goes, and it's over. The fight is over, and that is. Unfortunately, part of the difficulty of climbing, but sometimes a, a, a disappointing way to, to He's fall. He's approaching and, uh, the crux. He's doing a lot of scanning here. Um, and I wonder if it has anything to do with his energy levels. Uh, his caller's name is Saeed Ali. They've been climbing together for the last two years consistently in New York City. And Air is here, our first competitor in the B1 category, um, completely blindfolded. So that changes things a little bit. You're really relying on your collar a lot, really having to be efficient with your scanning um, and have a phenomenal endurance to be able to, to endure the time it takes while you figure out that beta. Colin Torpy easily found uh, the right place to hold on to that crux. He is out of Atlanta, likes to train out of Stone Summit Gym, one of the most experienced of uh, the climbers in this category, he's been to world championships multiple times and is showing himself on this route. Seems like anyone that competes at a Stone Summit knows the game pretty well. <laughs> they, put, they know how to put out some athletes. Oh yeah, definitely. Here, Colin, really proving that is true, nearing Steve's previous high point. You can see in the top left corner. Oh, Eris came down uh, above the crux area that most of the the visually impaired climbers had an issue with. Yeah, it's certainly a great burn. I wonder if it time. would put him on the podium. We'll have to check the scores. The scores here, the scoring can be oh, he's, a little. Oh, he's passing Steve's point here. All right, Colin. Sure enough, and then you can see that volume, that right foot that he may use or not use. Yes, winds up not being an issue. Fights his way through. Oh, oh, the pump, it looks like the fatigue builds there. And in, in some of the, when people fall earlier in the route, it looks like they might come up short or not find the position, but right around up there, that pump is really starting to, to set in. And you've got, that you can see, if we get the replay, two small holds that are guarding that, that final section of the route. I don't know if people at home can see how the wall is gradually getting steeper and steeper, putting more weight on the arms, and then the, their, uh, especially if they're wearing a prosthesis, that, that five pounds is a little yeah. bit heavier than it used to be. Well, an excellent, excellent fight for Jake there. Oh, excuse me, that was Colin, Jake Sanchez now. Jake, who I've had the pleasure of meeting at um, Pan American. The, the last event, actually, that we did before the pandemic hit was uh, the Pan American Cup in L.A. It was a phenomenal event, uh, and actually an event where we selected some of our Olympians. Anyway, I met Jake Sanchez there. Fantastic guy, very psyched, focused competitor. I know he's been looking forward to nationals for a long time. He, he was... He's been talking to me about it since the very first time I met him back then. So excited to see the day when Jake Sanchez can show up, get it done. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, coming up, we have Bill Kassan, who is a veteran to this category, also uh, out of Colorado. And um, he is a guy who has a lot of experience in competitions. He always tells me it's going to be his last year, then he comes back and crushes. I think there's probably something uh, you say, I'm going to retire. We see it in other sports. We see it here. Nah, I think this is my last year. I think, if I remember the documentary correctly, Michael Jordan did that back in the day. They all wanted to know, are you retiring? Is this your <laughs> last year? You're going to have to wait. I don't know yet. You don't want to leave. I could see the reasons you would. But it's hard to get out of the game. Jake here, nowhere close to retirement, looking so fresh here, very he, confident. He looks super comfortable. Doesn't look very pumpy at all, you know? 
He's had a phenomenal weekend. He actually is climbing much stronger than I've ever seen him climb. Getting a great rest there. That right hand looks decent. Getting a little match. Looking very composed. He might have got a quick look at the camera there right before we cut. I wonder <laughs> yeah. if he knew what he was looking at. I hope so. Now, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how uh, differently each of these climbers, based on their height, based on their amputation, works through all of these different movements. Come on, I want to cheer for him, and I can't. Jake finding what I believe is a high point already. Yes, he has moved into first, right here. Jake Sanchez looking for a top. Oh, oh, that hold looks a little flatter than you'd like as soon as I saw that one. Um, and a lot of these in competition and finals especially, they are designed to get progressively harder as you get near the top. Um, at least as far as I, I've been able to assess, that seems to be the way they break it down so that it does a better job of several things, separating the competitors and then throughout the competition. Um, I'm not sure that this is a priority, but you see climbers getting higher and higher as the competition goes, which is exciting. Right. Here, Bill taking his time. First crux, I think, based on some of our other competitors. Mm -hmm. Well, unlike some of the other competitors, um, Bill actually has a new collar. They've only been training together a couple of weeks, actually. And people don't understand that that can make a huge difference in how a climber, no matter how experienced, will approach a route like this. I could certainly see how that would be a major factor, the, the way you have to communicate in, in developing an efficient way of doing it. But in this case, it looks like it wasn't a problem. Bill, I think, kind of skipped two of the holds, <laughs> um, scanned around, decided to go all the way to this left hand, which he's now got matched, now looking for another deep lock off. That shows you the amount of skill that Bill has, and he has uh, made it to world championships uh, every competition, every nationals for team placement, he has made it. And he's showing us why. You know, I imagine right now is the steadiness of his breathing, how calm you'd have to be to not get pumped in, in basically be comfortable with the fact that you're taking a long time to scan and not mm -hmm. find the holds to maintain your composure. That was breathe, interesting. Steady. Yeah. It was an interesting choice for him to use his knee. Sure. Yeah. But it seems to be working out all right. Oh, oh. but I believe that was high point uh, for Bill. We have to check the scores to see. Here we have Kyle Long. Just getting started. Kyle's coming into finals seated in second place. Back to Bill here. Another lock off to this unusually shaped hold. Doesn't find it. Peels off. Kyle Long just getting started, gaining that right side pull. Here's another climber that's having a phenomenal weekend. He has some competition experience, but definitely the strongest I've ever seen him climb. Through qualifiers, he breezed through that round and is in a higher position he's ever been in any national championships. He's out of uh, North Carolina. Um, I believe this is his uh, maybe third uh, national championship. Very cool. Him not, doesn't seem to be having a problem at all so far with that uh, maybe initial crux gaining that large jug he's standing on now yeah he and chose a totally different way he didn't go all the way to the right he stayed more to the left yeah. of this route and only used that bottom volume that was a transition problem for a lot of climbers gaining a quick rest here before what looks like a little bit more bouldery section as he makes the way up. Seems like that's sort of a critical stopping point where you stop, you compose yourself, and then you fire through this next section. Nice flagging. Deep flag, quick shake. Still looking quite solid. 
He seems pretty comfortable here. I've definitely seen more flagging from him than any of the other competitors in his category. Mm -hmm. He's definitely making use of, of his balance, of his rests. Oh, it's slowing down a little bit here. Hard move. Go. Oh. Oh. Kyle coming up short as things turn up. That puts us only with Ronnie Dixon left. Yeah. We're very excited. We want to see you top, Ronnie. If you can hear me out there somewhere, which you can't. But if you could, I'd be asking you, show us the top. We'll have to see. Justin Proctor here. Just getting started, our last competitor of this section. The morning session, well, not quite drawn to a close. After this, we're going to switch categories. We've got two more to come. But for the categories we're sitting in right now, Justin here climbing now and Ronnie to come shortly will close out those categories. We'll see what they can do. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin here is an East Coast climber out of Massachusetts. He, claim, he climbs out of Central Rock Gym. Uh, this is his, I believe, third national competition. He got to make it to Worlds in 2019 and did pretty good. But uh, he is fairly new, uh, not as seasoned as Bill, but is making good work on this route. Yeah, Justin looking pretty strong here, scanning quickly, finding his way through, not really getting held up for very long, which the, the time that you may get held up in any given section seems, if you get stuck in one spot for a while, the fatigue that can build up there can be enormous. So quickly making his way through, which is great to see. It, it truly shows the importance of the relationship between the caller and the climber. To, to know how to communicate with each other, to be able to see when your climber, you know, needs another move or is in a position that, uh, you know, may cause fatigue, and and you know, help that climber out there. Yeah, of course. Here's Ronnie getting started. Ronnie Dixon is a legend in paraclimbing. He was the first uh, uh, U.S. climber. Uh, with Craig DiMartino, one of the first to actually compete in the in the world circuit. Originally from Florida, where there is absolutely no climbing. I tell you what, <laughs> I don't know how, but Florida puts out some strong climbers. I know I plenty tell you, of them. You got Megan Martin, you got Ronnie Dixon. I believe one of our setters, Mark, is from Florida Mark originally. Mark Mercer, one yeah. of our setters here, yeah. Yeah. You spend all that time in the gym, you get good. What else are you going to do? Justin is keeping himself small on routes. Uh, he's one of the taller competitors, um, but I feel like he's making good use of that, being able to scan so much farther. I wonder if that is you know, part of the reason why he's getting past where uh, Bill fell. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I do know that I'm excited to see him way up on this route. I hope that he makes it through this. It looks like He's hit match. high point, I believe, for, the, for uh, this category. Scores are not yet in. You know, Can't I think those two... Those two round holds must be worse than they look, like they so <laughs> often are. Yeah. Ronnie here, still casual. Looking super comfortable. I'm certainly still hoping for the top. Ronnie nearing the high point here. If he hasn't already found it, if he controls this big letterbox, oh, there we go. That's what we want to see. He doesn't look pumped at all. He's chilling. There's 18 seconds. Uh, he's already reached high point. He's maintaining his first place from qualifiers with ease. Looks like Justin did not find his way to the top, but we cannot be sure. Ronnie Dixon, however, managing his sequence through some small pockets. Looks like a giant sloping rail here. Works the feet, probably finds the match, and continues to the head wall. From wherever you are sitting at home, if you can channel your support for Ronnie Dixon through that television, do it. You know, Ronnie Dixon is the first athlete to ever be sponsored by Evolve that is a paraclimber. 
is you can see why <laughs> he's a great dude and he's a, a strong competitor great Quick climber it's, so good yeah ronnie fighting for it now we like to see a little bit of that action moving a little quicker Ronnie now with the top in sight. Looks like three holds and then the top. Ronnie getting a quick rest here. When Ronnie's not making quick work of routes, he actually is a prosthetist. He makes prosthetic legs for a living and helps people get as active as him. But apparently he's keeping that skill of climbing and killing it to himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for him to keep. <laughs> I'm sure there are many people watching at home right now and being like... It looks like he's getting a little me. pumped. He's finding his rest here. I wonder if he has enough to take him all the way to the top. Here he goes. Three holds. He's fighting. Ronnie fighting for it. One more to go. He's fighting. Looking for the feet. Oh, yeah. Ronnie he's Dixon done it. Ronnie Dixon finds it and matches. Takes it home with our only top. Absolutely fitting. True legend. Ronnie Dixon giving the people exactly what they wanted to see. It's certainly what I want to see. We got our top secured first place with a little bit of fight, but he had more. Here's the replay. Ronnie approaching the top. Finds it. A quick celebration. And there we have it. You know, I do wonder if we could get him in here for a brief interview. I don't know whether he's pinned down somewhere else or not, but maybe throughout the day we can find him and ask him about that route. We're now switching gears and changing categories. Uh, we are now working our way through our seated category, which is known in the uh, paraclimbing as a one. A female A1 category is going up first and the male A1 category. Well, first up uh, to climb is uh, Ariel Rawson, uh, who is accompanied by her aide Caitlin uh, out of New York City. While we're waiting for them to get ready, I would let, I would love to see a little bit more of uh, Ronnie's final burn here. That'd be so good. Unless Ariel is about to begin, but just the way we saw many very capable athletes struggling their way much lower on the route, and, and Ronnie is really showing that he's kind of in a league of strength almost of his own. It was a very dominant performance there. Um, and making it to the high point, not struggling, resting on the what was the previous high point, getting it all back, and then proceeding to the head wall with relative ease. Um, I think in any sport, that's what you love to see. You love to see someone come out and just tear down. And look at that! To wow. really show that, like the only top of that category, just crushed next it. Next level competing is always exciting to watch. And here, Ronnie Dixon is giving it to us. Especially the con the concentration, the transition of that footwork onto his prosthesis is really not easy to do. And he did it and he crushed it. Over on the other category, we have Adam Payne, probably one of the uh, longest running competitors in paraclimbing, always crushing it and representing for RP1. He has a rare form of ataxia. He's out of uh, New York City. He was in my sponsored team for about ooh, five years, maybe six. <laughs> so you know him. You know, yeah. like a lot of these competitors, yeah. you know him uh, well and you've been around. <laughs> well, they're from New York City. I definitely oh, know him. Of course. <laughs> um, but uh, Adam here is uh, climbing with the Para Cliffhangers team out of Queens, New York. Um, and he actually has been climbing since the 90s before his ataxia, which is uh, similar to like uh, Parkinson's. Okay. In the way that it affects the mobility. So RP1 is the more severe of the RP categories, which is a uh, neurological conditions that affect mobility. Okay, I see. 
And so he's been climbing from the 90s since he since he was yeah since he was the 20 since he was in his 20s and then of course th his disability took hold he stopped climbing and then uh, he found me at a eastern mountain sports store when i was working there <laughs> and i invited him to go climbing <laughs> very cool the way it unfolds <laughs> stops climbing because he thinks he has to rediscovers the fact that he does not have to stop climbing and here today he's at nationals and not his first nationals very cool. Adam, taking the time to find his way through here, looks like he may have to use that volume with the right hand or he's looking for this match. Mm -hmm. Really hoping he finds his way through. With this particular this mobility, he actually can't control where his hand and his feet will land, which adds to the difficulty in climbing. Yes, it's every excellent fight by Adam. I'm so win. excited to see him gain this left hand. Hopefully he can manage these feet and continue to work his way up here. Every move Finds is the a left huge foot. He has great flexibility. I mean, look at that. Long limbs, great flexibility, and great strength. Yes. He's about 48 years old now. Adam Payne, 48. Kind of crushing right now. Very exciting to watch him stay in this fight. Managing to nail down all of these feet and hands. Looking very good here. Very fluid. Here for the ladies, this is, I believe, Arielle Rosin. Yes, this is her first time ever competing, period. All right, first time competitors. We talked about it earlier. We've got seasoned vets that are over 50. We have youngins, and we have people that are totally new to the sport here. Now, this is the seeded category. Yes, I mean, I mean that's what we originally called it, but... Uh, by technicality, it's called uh, AL1. AL1. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can see, this is the campus route. This is no joke. This is some hard climbing. Lots and lots of strength required here. Now, outside of climbing, she's already an athlete in wheelchair racing. So there's no surprise here that she is fighting, fighting, fighting as a first time competitor. Speaking of fighting, Adam Payne still, still in the game. So Ariel could not make it through, but I believe Adam is still in the fight. And there he is. Adam still working his way up, gains the right hand, works the feet again. Looks like he's got to either go up left hand, maybe match, and then gain a couple of pair of opposing side pulls. Adam loses the feet, stays on, and recovers. He has amazing grip strength. Amazing grip strength. So even though that it, it, it may be a difficulty in, in uh, controlling where his feet lands, his, his grip strength is his saving grace on all his routes and that amazing flexibility. Yeah, it, it, it seems like even if it takes time to get things to land in the right place, once they do, they're not coming They're off. on. They're sticking. They're super on. Exactly. The hands, the feet, and it's, I mean, this is... Ah, oh, he's off. Excellent performance by Adam Payne. What a Payne. great performance. Our the crowd, crowd goes wild. He has a lot of fans here in Salt Lake City Very, and all over the world. I can't wait till this, uh, maybe next year, Paraclimbing Nationals is going to be a spectated event. Uh, and we're going to blow the roof off this place. Who knows, I may be working the in-house crowd that next year, so I won't be able to be with you here on the Internet, but who knows how it will shake down. It is going to be a good time, and it's a good time right now. Replay of Adam Payne coming up short, doesn't find that left hand. He makes every route exciting. Exciting. Probably my favorite one. I would say that, that was my favorite attempt so far. And next up on the uh, AL1 category for females is Manasi Deshpandi out of Chicago, Illinois. Of course, I am slightly not objective because she's on my team. <laughs> hey, that's okay. That's okay. No one can be perfectly objective. <laughs> but also, uh, she has been climbing a really long time, too. This is her fourth national championship, and she has made worlds a couple of times. Well, she's showing us why, making quick work. It must be the Adidas. <laughs> cool kicks. 
I always Indeed. notice the kicks on the campus climbers, like their choice of kicks, like, is it lightweight? Is it heavy? Yeah. You know, because that adds weight to the transition. So, um, and, and with different disabilities in the seated category. So for instance, you could have someone with spina bifida, you can have someone who's paraplegic is in the seated category. But the most important thing is that they cannot use their legs to climb. No, I see. And it's it's a cool, it's a different technique here. Um, it's not like, I don't know, this is not the technical term, rage campusing. <laughs> She's, like you said earlier, resting, uh, taking her time. Shaking it out here breathing, and there. Breathing. Breathing, exactly. Hanging loose, planning, matching when necessary. Making her way up. I did speak with the setters briefly about this route. Um, like many of them, sort of a resistance route. Uh, but near the top, there is a uh, particular undercling you've got to manage, which if anyone, I'm sure you know at home, that camping on underclings is inherently problematic. <laughs> um, and I do hope that she gets there. I wonder if we can see it. It's way up on the route. Wow. She definitely has her endurance. She's definitely a much stronger climber than she was two years ago in Brian's Sun at the World Championships. This is very cool. I would, I would, it would be fun to try that. And I, I don't think I would do it. I'll tell you that right now. Here's Jack Greener. I'm not too familiar with Jack Greener. I'm thinking it's the first competitor up that I have no idea. I don't know this guy, right, but well, I watched him in qualifiers, and I was impressed. For once, we're on a level playing field now, <laughs> which I like. Jack Greener oh, here. Oh, we got a oh. fall for Monacy. But what a great performance. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder what her biceps feel like right now. My <laughs> biceps hurt just thinking about it. Uh, I remember she uh, had emailed me. She said, can I get a new team shirt? I need something bigger. Bigger because, sleeves. Yeah, but she, yeah. She said, it's tight on my arms now. Yeah. Well, so I know she's her. been working hard. <laughs> Here's Jack, Jack Greener. He is making his way up this route a little bit uh, quicker than our previous competitor. Here, Jack, I believe, matching Adam's high point right now. Yeah. Finding the match in the left hand, looking for the side pulls. Ooh, and fights for it, saves it. Now looking for that match on that left hand side pull. Uh oh. And finds it. Oh, oh. Ah. unfortunately, so close. Loses the feet. But I, I wonder if that counts. Uh, uh, was that high point for this category? I have to think so. Yeah. I think. Now, I, I'm not sure on this. If you've got two side poles that are the same height as one another, one of them is designed to be gone to first, and the other one would be the. the subsequent move in that the way the scoring works a lot of you at home know this every hold is its own point value and that's how they grade it um, you get points for controlling a hold and there is a partial point now we have had some transitions this year we're moving to IFSC rules adopting what they do uh, many small differences that do make a big difference ultimately but the points for for roots right now are every hold is worth a point. You get a point for controlling it. And then there is a partial point or a plus for generating upward movement off that hold. So that's that's how we're breaking down the scores. That's what the judges are looking for. Right here coming up to uh, our final competitor in the female AL1 category is Carly Cook, another seasoned competitor. Um, she started climbing in Chicago uh, with Adaptive Climbing Group. Bef uh, while she was a student in college and then uh, moved East Coast uh, into Massachusetts and Connecticut climbing there. Um, she is definitely the one to beat. Um, her disability specifically is spina bifida. Oh, she's quick. And she makes quick work. I mean, look at those guns. Yes. And I just I love letting the momentum. In a competition. <laughs> She's taking a very different route here. It's not this slow thing. It's kind of gaining momentum, swinging through hold to hold. Um, I think it seems like time is a major factor here. The longer you're hanging, 
You're getting pumped the whole time. As soon as you leave I the ground. I feel like uh, she's definitely using the swing of her legs and uh, transitioning with her core muscles. Yeah, absolutely. To kind of give her that extra lift. Uh, oh, that's a crux right there. Let's see how she makes it through that. Oh. Oh, boy. Here we go. She looks for it. Looks like she's trying to get a little bit of a swing. Use that momentum. We got a whole crowd behind her here. Carly Cook. Oh, this is a nail biter. Did, oh, <sighs> does not find it, unfortunately. It. But an excellent burn by Carly. Definitely shows why she has come in first every national competition she competed in. Very cool. And and with the campusing, you, it's you can't use your feet. So, but it is not simply pulling over and over again. There are many ways to use technique, momentum, swinging, especially swinging, um, so that it doesn't have to be a controlled pull-up every time, but you can toss your momentum around, which, which Carly was demonstrating really well and used it to, to move quickly. Here's Josh Unterman. Josh Unterman is a West Coast native out of the Bay Area, uh, trains in uh, touchstone climbing gyms. Josh taking his time here, checking things out. You get the route preview, but it always helps take a few seconds, even if it's just to get oriented on the first few holds of the route, compose yourself for a second. It's common to see climbers not rush out and get started right away, but to take that moment to check things out. Josh moving pretty methodical so far. A lot of control there. Um, in his current disability, you'll notice he's wearing what looked like ice climbing uh, 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 shoes or boots that have that same 510 rubber along with his brace in order to transition uh, with his disability. He had his... Um, his footwear specifically made so just so that he can climb. Very cool, and it seems to be working quite well here. He's struggling over here with this particular movement, but he's actually approaching a uh, high point of uh, Jack Greener in just a couple of moves. There he goes, works the feet, gains the right-hand side pull. Now I know I can tow in my ice climbing boots. I'm going to have to try that. The edge looks actually real good really on those. Really good, yeah. yeah. I see how, um, if you look at the bottom, it, it's smooth, and they've uh, resold it with climbing rubber. Yeah, it, yeah. it looks, it is clear that those, um, they know sneakers. They're working. <laughs> They're not sneakers. So. Yeah, he's okay. using those. We're up to the uh, male RP um, AL1 category currently, and he uh, we have a uh, fairly new competitor um, who is making work of this wall. Jorge Messias. Jorge fighting already, maybe taking a quick rest for the next move. Looks for the left hand and finds it. Already a little bit of action. He's also a little taped up, I see there. I wonder if that's having any play in uh, how he's oh, performing today. Goes for the rest. One-handed, I love it. Oh, it looks like we have High Point uh, with this gentleman here. He's definitely has breezed, breezed past the other competitors in this category. Yeah, Joshua looking very strong here. Sort of looks like a long twist to this right hand. Changes up the feet just a little bit. Working things out. Goes for a press and the knee gains the right hand. Looks like that'll be control for that. Works the feet one more time as he tries to go up again. Looks nice. like it could be a Gaston here. That's gonna be a hard transition. Duh. Oh, it looks like he was slightly out of position to put the weight into that left hand Gaston and sort Such of Such good off. climbing. This is actually the first time I've ever seen a competitor with these sort of modified climbing shoes. I mean, give it to the West Coast to give us something new. Yeah, they're real cool. There's the like 
boots. So I, I can't tell what brand they are. They look familiar to me. Um, yeah, look like Mountaineer boots, but they're doing their job, certainly. Josh with a high point there in RP1. One more chance now. Next out for RP1 is going to be Sonny Yang. Sonny Yang, now the table to turn this time. I know Sonny Yang too. Not well, I will say. Uh, but Sonny lives near the Red River Gorge, just outside of Slade, Kentucky. Uh, has a little climbing gym there that people like love to go to. He's a really awesome member of his community. Um, somebody that I've had the pleasure of meeting briefly. And I, I know that he's been fighting to climb at his best ever since the incident that gave him the disability that he has with now. And I'm excited to see that put to the test here at Nationals. But an amazingly strong climber. He doesn't just live near the Red River Gorge. He is the Red River Gorge. He is that community. Yeah. Yeah, he's a staple. Absolutely. Um, he's known everywhere he goes. He's a super nice guy. I believe and he uh, also wrote a book. Uh, he signed it for me, gave it to me yesterday. It's in my car. I can't wait to read it. Just about his whole journey. Um, because he was a well-known climber prior to his accident and then still continuing to climb and dominate in a whole another category. I can't wait for you guys to see this climber. There was Josh making his way to that high point right before he peeled off, looking for that left-hand Gaston. Here just getting ready now is Carlos Quiles. Carlos Quiles is an East Coast climber out of Connecticut. I believe this might be his third or fourth uh, competition. So kind of middle of the road experience wise, not, not a seasoned competitor, but also not his first one. Coming into final seated in the second place. Um, I want to see that high point, obviously. See how far he can get. I'm curious, what is the approach? Is it the speed? Is it the strength, maybe? The strength, uh, yeah, The weight of the body be... versus the strength. You know? Yeah. Uh, just like in any other climber, uh, whether they are able-bodied or not, you know, uh, strength to weight ratio, skill, technicality, are you taking your rest? All play a part in how well these climbers do today. Here's Sonny getting started. Now, I haven't seen Sonny in quite a long time, and I'd, I've just been watching videos on Facebook, honestly, is where I see him be in the gym, putting down boulders, putting down roots. Uh, love to see it here live. I gave him that hat. All right. <laughs> like two years ago. I'm like, wait, I know that hat. <laughs> maybe, maybe that hat would help him uh, transition into a high point, you think? It's good luck hat. <laughs> so it could good be a good luck, luck hat. Yeah, yeah, I'll believe. I'll give him that. <laughs> Carlos is obviously feeling really comfortable today because he is making quick work of this route. Quick matches as he reads the sequence, making his way up. Now I can see how... It's like matching your feet on every stair you take. It Correct. It's going to slow you down a little bit, um, but instead, in this case, if you're going to not match it at all, it's going to wear you out because you're pulling through all the way. Absolutely. Um, and then also you get more power in pulling a full body weight if both your hands are matched on the holes. Yeah. You're not dispersing your, your energy and strength. Yes, yeah, so you're making a little compromise between speed versus uh, conserving energy, and they're doing that constantly, deciding... How He's got a lot it. of fans in the gym. I can hear them screaming his name. Carlos taking a moment before he goes. Finds the right hand. He's going to look for the match. Carlos still in the fight. I'm curious this if he's going to shuffle move. to the right or not. He's, he's, he's gonna, it looks like he's going to take it. All and right. he calls it. Yeah. That would have been a big move, you know, uh, for him to yep. transition onto. Yes, he, once the fatigue starts to set in, especially um, maybe a move that wouldn't have been a big deal on the ground becomes a big deal when you're halfway up the route. Here's Sonny Yang looking 
So steady. He's going a totally different way than our previous competitor, actually choosing to really take a hold of uh, those half circles. And Sonny coming into the finals, seated in first place, and it looks like he's going to look to keep that position. He's very close to reclaiming the high point here once he gets above these large volumes. Climbers Home uh, is... Um, an organization that uh, he works with, actually. That's his shirt right there. Uh, yeah, that's his home. shirt, yeah, that he's wearing today. Here he goes. He's this is the sequence that will determine whether he gets the first or, I guess, I suppose, the second. Gains the right hand. Works the feet. Now he's looking for this left-hand Gaston, unless he decides to, it's going to be left-hand Gaston. He's looking for this it. This is a hard transition. Missing the right foot that you would want to push into that. For He's this category, this is very difficult. A very figuring difficult out what move, is yeah. the play, Sonny. He's considering maybe switching feet and going right hand, but... For RP1, balance is one of the, the major... There he goes. ...transitional points. Finds it. Yeah. And that is going to be... Enough. So good. If I, and that'll be enough right there. Sonny Yang takes it, but still in the fight. Sonny, of course, looking for the top, like every single competitor. And looking very solid. I mean, he doesn't look particularly pumped. No. He's being methodical, taking his time, working things out. There's still a lot more route left. I thought the very same thing. Yeah, certainly getting getting behind Sonny Yang right now, looking as fresh as he did at the very bottom of the route. Nice and patient, working out this beta. Looks like he may have skipped a little hold there. Crosses all the way up. Here we have Tanner Sislaw. Tanner Sislaw is also a West Coast guy out of California and uh, the youngest competitor in this category. Um, oh, he's skipping holds. He's one of our strongest, I can tell right now. He actually worked as a youth coach in his local gym for some time. Okay. Uh, Pre-pandemic. Very cool. Tanner here, um, he's saving himself a lot of time. He's obviously got the strength to do so, but he's skipping holds left and right um, to mitigate that pump. Taking a quick rest here. Looked like there was a lot of output in the first third of this route. Now taking a moment to get it all back before he cranks through the next section. And there he goes, one after the other. Wow, I, I think he might top this route. He may top it, we will see. He has such great strength, and you can see him breathing in between some of these major crux moves. Managing the rest this way seems, I don't know what it seems. It seems very difficult to deal with. <laughs> there are different muscles that you're using when you're, when you're in that position. So yeah. you're thinking forearm, and the forearms are actually not being used at all when in rest. Hard cross there. Tanner's still fighting for it. The crowd now getting behind him. Another long move there. A match. So good. Oh, he's hitting that top wall. He won gold at the last world championships in Brion Saint France in 2019. And so he's showing us why. World Cup gold medalist here. Taking the quick rest, looking for the top, getting close. Starting to melt a little bit, but saves it. Tanner Sislaw still in the fight. Oh, oh wow. Loses it. Excellent Such, performance. So good. So strong. He's got many wins left in him for sure. He's got the guns. Look at the pythons in that guy. That was... 
That's what you want right there. Definitely. That's what you want. And I believe that closes out session one. We've had AL2, AL1, RP1, and then B1, 2, and 3 done. We're taking a short break now. I don't know the time. Five minutes, maybe 15 <laughs> minutes. We haven't been perfectly briefed on that, but... We're gonna get our next round of climbers together and resume the action. Here we've got Chloe again. First top of the day. Bunch of replays. Y'all sit tight for just a few moments. I think we're gonna run replays of all the action from the morning and we're gonna be back in the action with AU2, RP2, and RP3. Just a few moments. Thank you for joining us. Cool. Thanks. 